The film action moves out west later this evening when we join Clint Eastwood as that enigmatic stranger, this time after a psychopathic killer for a few dollars more, at 11.15 on one. On BBC Two shortly, the final part of the story of Christabel Bielenberg, adapted for television by Dennis Potter. Here on one in 15 minutes, match of the day features FA Cup second round action and live the draw from the third. Now on BBC One, the news and sport with Michael Burke and David Icke. President Gorbachev has been met by crowds of weeping men and women in the ruined cities of Soviet Armenia. The earthquake victims plead with him for more equipment to search for survivors. The first official death toll, 45,000 and rising. Good evening. President Gorbachev is touring the devastated cities of Soviet Armenia tonight. People have been pleading with him for more equipment to search for the thousands of earthquake victims still buried under the rubble. He's told them, our tragedy is immeasurable, our loss is great. The first official estimate of those losses came today, 45,000 dead, an approximate figure that's bound to rise. Half a million Armenians are now thought to have lost their homes. Mr Gorbachev has now taken charge of a rescue operation that eyewitnesses say has so far been poorly organised and badly equipped. Even the Soviet media are now asking why such flimsy buildings were put up in a danger zone which has now suffered its worst earthquake in a thousand years. The Kremlin flag at half mast, the seat of Soviet power showing its grief over Armenia's tragedy. In Armenia itself, Mr. Gorbachev has been expressing that grief to the Republic's leaders, and he's toured the worst affected areas. In a series of emotive encounters, he heard women talk of their dead families, men from the crowd shouting that more cranes were needed. And he replied that the whole country shared in Armenia's sorrow. It was, he said, impossible to express what he'd seen in the suffering of Lenina Khan. He spoke of the need to evacuate women and children, but he urged the men to stay and help clear the ruins. And he had high praise for the rescue teams from abroad, saying their presence in Armenia was the finest expression of human solidarity. For the people of Lenina Khan, deprived of homes and possessions, there's little enough comfort to be found, but they are the fortunate ones. The rough wooden coffins on every street speak of a community now having to bury tens of thousands of its sons and daughters. For the living, the priority is still the search for survivors. Three days after the earthquake, the voices from the rubble are getting fainter. In the national media, criticism of the lack of preparedness for such a disaster is growing. The injured have filled every hospital bed in Armenia. Those requiring specialist treatment are evacuated to Moscow. Rescue work continues round the clock, and there's no shortage of volunteers. Few in Armenia have been untouched by this disaster. Thousands of homeless are still living on the streets. Nighttime temperatures plunge way below zero, and bonfires bring little warmth to frozen bodies and broken lives. The first plane loads of food and medicines from Britain have been arriving in the Soviet Union today, part of the international response to the Armenian disaster. More emergency supplies are on the way. Armenians in Britain say they've been moved by people's generosity. Britain is also sending mechanical diggers to help in the search for survivors. The earth movers were part of a 17-ton consignment of aid materials loaded at Stansted under Red Cross supervision. Also on board were tents and blankets. The earth movers were sent in response to a specific Soviet request. How difficult is it to learn how to drive them? It is quite difficult. It's going to be a, a sort of quick course, but uh, I'm sure they'll pick it up in an hour or two. and. Uh, they're obviously desperate for the machines, so they're going to find them get very useful, I would think. The original plan was for the RAF to fly out these earth movers on one of their Hercules transporters from Bryce Norton. But then somebody realised the Hercules wasn't big enough, the JCB simply wouldn't fit onto it. So they're using these Belfast aircraft, originally operated by the RAF, but now used by a civilian cargo airline. Though even on these huge planes, the earth movers are a tight fit. This is one of dozens of flights from all over the world which are heading for the earthquake zone. This transporter flies first to Istanbul and must then await clearance to fly into what's becoming congested airspace over Armenia's capital, Yerevan. 
The disaster is creating an overwhelming public response here, both from Britain's Armenian community and elsewhere. The coordination and organisation of the materials and cash which are being donated is a major task. This West London centre for the Aid Armenia charity has received several tonnes of clothing and blankets. The Soviet embassy are asking for a wide range of medical supplies, including blood transfusion equipment and dialysis machines. And perhaps confusingly, there are now at least four cash appeals underway. Indeed, the Red Cross say they want only cash donations. Other appeals are organised by Aid Armenia, the YMCA through the building societies, and here at the Moscow Narodny Bank in the city of London. Members of the Armenian community in West London rearranged their traditional Christmas celebrations today. Instead of a party, they held a special service in memory of the victims of the earthquake. The Armenian church in central London, outside the children of Armenian families, unaware of the pain and uncertainty felt by their parents and grandparents, who still don't know what's happened to relatives left behind in their homeland. This was meant to be a celebration, a Christmas party for older members of the Armenian community. After the earthquake, it was hastily rearranged as a somber gathering to comfort those whose families are caught up in the tragedy. I have my wife with me, whose sister, daughter, and two grandchildren, grown up, and a husband, five of them. They are in Leninagan, and we don't know what happened to them. Afterwards, these pensioners, many dependent on social security, gave another £800 for disaster relief. Up to a dozen policemen are expected to be charged in the next few days after a riot outside the News International plant at Wapping in 1987. This follows a two-year investigation by the Police Complaints Authority and officers from the Northamptonshire Police. On the first anniversary of the Wapping dispute, a thousand policemen were confronted by 13,000 demonstrators. In the pitched battle that followed, police said they were attacked and severely provoked. Marchers claimed some officers responded with brutality. The Independent Police Complaints Authority called in detectives from Northamptonshire to investigate allegations from more than 60 people. Using hours of videotape and hundreds of photographs, they painstakingly analysed the night's events. 600 policemen were interviewed and so far 35 files have been sent for the Crown Prosecution Service to decide whether the evidence supports criminal charges, including assault, perjury and conspiracy to pervert the course of justice. Decisions were taken yesterday at the London office of the Prosecution Service and Scotland Yard were informed last night. It's believed up to a dozen officers are being told over the weekend that they're about to be charged. Sports, a shock for Wales at rugby and a flying start for the bald eagle. The details from David Icke. The top two clubs in the first division met today, but they couldn't produce a goal. Norwich and Arsenal drew nil-nil at Carrow Road, with Brian Marwood missing a penalty for Arsenal. Elsewhere, Chris Waddle scored one of the Spurs goals in their 2-0 win over Millwall. So Norwich stay two points clear, but Coventry move up to third after a 1-0 win over Manchester United. Liverpool play Everton tomorrow, while Southampton drew one all with Nottingham Forest. Jim Smith watched his first match as manager of the bottom club, Newcastle United, today when they met another struggling side, Wimbledon. Smith takes over at St James's Park amid a boardroom battle for control of the club. Turmoil behind the scenes at Newcastle as the board battles to retain control. 50 pence shares are being sold for thousands of pounds to the man who developed Europe's largest shopping complex, the Metro Centre, in Gateshead. I do not want to take over the club. I want to democratise it. I want to understand to get control, but we'll hand it back to the fans very shortly thereafter. The present chairman, Gordon McKeague, doesn't believe him. He says the club is democratically owned by the present shareholders. Into all this walks the new manager, Jim Smith. Definitely Mr McKeague's choice, pointedly not Mr Hall's. The embattled chairman recently lost a board member to Mr Hall, but still says he'll win. There is no way, in my view, in which Mr Hall will get control, unless one of my... Um, fellow directors did defend. And you're confident that won't happen? Yes. Six matches without a goal reflects the unsettling atmosphere at St James's Park, but Kevin Brock, who arrived this week with his manager, helped break the duck. Hendry then finished things off. 
Boardroom rows matter, but the fans' first concern is success on the pitch. Wimbledon equalised early in the second half. Their former keeper, Besant, stranded for Gibson's athletic strike. But Newcastle won the match with a goal of exceptional quality. Hendry's second and Newcastle's first win in seven games. Newcastle two, Wimbledon one. It was also the second round of the FA Cup in England, with many of the smaller clubs hoping to knock out league opposition. Runcorn, who play in the Vauxhall Conference, had already beaten 4th Division Wrexham in the first round. Today they were at home to Crewe. In Runcorn, they tell you of their pride in Europe's longest steel arch bridge, and of the Canal Street ground below, where their rugby league club lost by over 90 points this season. Today, on the same pitch, the team's non-league football club were desperately trying to write a more acceptable piece of history. But when Peter Byrne's penalty was saved by crew goalkeeper Grey Goose, their day was to turn sour. The fourth division side raced straight to the other end to take the lead through Mark Gardner. Two more were to follow. Edwards Cross, expertly finished by Fishenden, and then Edwards himself wrapping things up. 3-0 to crew, and within an hour their fans will know whether they'll get a crack at Liverpool. And you can see that third round draw and a round-up of all the cup action, including the day's upsets in Match of the Day, immediately after the news. The Welsh Rugby Union side have suffered a humiliating defeat in front of their own supporters. They lost to Romania by 15 points to 9 at the scene of some of their greatest triumphs, Cardiff Arms Park. Tenacity and determination earned Romania their historic win, both qualities much in evidence as Georges Jean barged over for their only try. Wales came back early in the second half, Devereaux capitalising on a rare move of quality. But at the end, Romania deserved their celebrations. In Rugby League, Widnes are through to the final of the John Player Special Trophy after beating the holders St Helens, Martin O'Fire scoring two of their four tries. There's the pace, there's nobody will catch this lad. It's a formality. St Helens also applied some tremendous pressure and at one stage led by eight points thanks to two tries by Les Quirk. But Widnes came back late in the match to win by just two points. Oh, here's a chance. Alan Tate, he's put his head back. A beautiful pass to Richard Ayres. He's in. Widnes 20, St Helens 18. Princess Anne has admitted she was a huge disappointment when she was a young princess. She's also said that despite being president of the Save the Children Fund, she doesn't particularly like children. The Princess Royal was speaking during a television interview to be broadcast tomorrow. As a young woman, the Princess Royal admits she didn't fit the public's idea of a fairy tale princess, wearing, as she puts it, a long white dress and a crown. It was certainly true, I think, to begin with, I was a huge disappointment uh, <laughs> to everybody concerned, because princesses only do came in certain. Do you really think that's form. true? That oh, you were a huge so. disappointment? Oh, yes, definitely. What, were you, what was disappointing them about you? Well, I, don't, I simply wasn't their image of a princess. But the Princess Royal's work as the president of the Save the Children Fund won her the affection of the nation. And yet, she says, when she took on the job, she wasn't fond of children, and she still isn't. I do say from time to time, and people tend to laugh, but at that age, I mean, I wasn't particularly keen on children, and I'm still not. But you don't actually have to like children very much to be interested in giving them the best possible start in life. The Princess Royal speaks of her fears that the Olympic Games may become unviable because there'll be too many people competing. And she warns that there are plenty of athletes who are prepared to take the risk of using performance-boosting drugs. Asked why she enjoys riding, the Princess Royal says it's because horses are no respecters of rank. Oh, no! Just a little too slowly, I'm afraid. Tonight's main story again. Mr Gorbachev sees for himself the devastation caused by the earthquake in Armenia. The official death toll is now 45,000. And a look at tomorrow's front pages. The Sunday Times claims that years of corruption led to the high death toll in the Armenian earthquake. The Mail reports that the Church of England faces the most serious split in its history over women priests. 
And the Mirror says rock star Brian May bought his wife a goodbye present of one million pound house after falling for an EastEnders star. From the newsroom, good night. Public opinion across the world has once again been entranced by Mr. Gorbachev. His speech at the UN proposing a new era of trust between nations, promising human rights at home and a military cutback on his own front line, poses a great challenge to the Western Alliance. What will be the response? Sir Geoffrey Howe returns from the NATO summit to go on the record about an opportunity not to be missed. That's on the record tomorrow after the news at one o'clock on BBC One. Hello to today was an extremely mild December day with temperatures anywhere between 3 and 7 degrees above normal. Now tomorrow is also going to be a fairly mild day but there are some changes taking place. This cold front is going to swing southeastwards and it's going to cross Scotland and much of Northern Ireland during the first part of tomorrow so bringing some fresher cooler weather and it'll turn out to be quite windy too with gales in northern parts of Scotland. Tonight then, the cloud thickening up over Northern Ireland, west into Northern Scotland, bringing some patchy rain with it, one or two heavier bursts elsewhere. A fairly cloudy but dry night, so the temperatures staying well up. Tomorrow then, that rain working its way into Northern England and the rest of Northern Ireland, fairly patchy and light in most places. And in the southern half of the country, basically dry and bright, though the clouds thickening up all the time with some rain getting into southern Wales. By this time, all of Northern Ireland and Scotland fairly bright with one or two showers in the extreme north. And turning out to be rather windy up in this northeastern corner with gales at times. That's it from me. Good night to you. BBC One's Christmas films include a first chance to see Eddie Murphy bringing his unique style of humour to Beverly Hills Cop. <laughs> this is a gentleman who crashed through Victor Maitland's window, who disabled an unmarked unit with a banana. Is this the gentleman who ruined the buffet at the Harrow Club this morning? <laughs> Eddie Murphy wears out his welcome on the West Coast in Beverly Hills Cop on Boxing Day at 8.20. One of the famous first-run films for Christmas on one. And the bad guys had better watch out later this evening as Clint Eastwood has been easily persuaded for a few dollars more to join forces with bounty hunter Lee Van Cleef at 11.15. First on one, Desmond Lynham rides into town with a fistful of football in Match of the Day. the FA Cups for extroverts on and off the field. Now, five straight wins will get you to the cup final if your starting place is the third round. Five straight wins brought Kettering Town from the first qualifying stage of the competition to today's second round proper to play Bristol Rovers.